Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger, and on this episode of Better Off, we are talking to Ryan Serhant, the star of Bravo's Million Dollar Listing New York. A lot of people bounce around from company to company to company, which I understand if there's better deals, but I've always felt it was better to just make the grass greener on the lawn you're already at. That costs a lot less than the reciprocal damage that you'll have going from company to company to company to company. And there's always something weird, I find, by like people who can't last at one company. Welcome to the Better Off Podcast. We're sponsored by Betterment, the largest independent online financial advisor. Well, we've got a treat for you today because we are marrying two things that I love to talk about, selling and real estate. I don't really love talking about real estate, but I know you love talking about real estate. So who do we have for you today? We have kind of a TV star. His name is Ryan Serhant. And you may have seen him on Bravo's Million Dollar Listing New York and his own show, Sell It Like Serhant. He's written a book and he wants to help you sell more, earn more and become the ultimate sales machine. It sounds kind of skeevier than it is. He's very interesting. He's got a fascinating life story. So here's our interview with Ryan Serhant. You're listening to Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. Ryan Serhant, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. So uh, you got a new book out, Sell It Like Serhant. Yes. How to Sell More, Earn More, and Become the Ultimate Sales Machine. We'll get to that in a second. Okay. Let's start like we start every program. You ready? What's the best career or money decision you've ever made? I think probably getting a job. Um, and getting out of the acting business and actually biting the bullet and getting into real estate. Um, It was something I didn't think I would ever have to do. And it was a big difference between becoming a waiter or becoming a bartender or just having a quote-unquote survival job and actually saying, you know what, let's try to make something else happen and see what happens and not view the fact that the acting thing didn't work out as a huge brick wall, but actually view it more as like a little bit of a fence. Mm -hmm. And let's see if there's another way to go around that fence. And I'm not going to complain about it. I'm not going to move home. I'm not going to cry. I'm going to figure it out one step at a time and actually try to afford to live here. That's a very good one. Sort of like career and financial. Like you can stumble and get to the next place. Yeah, that's how I, I mean, listen, that is my whole life. It's just saying yes to everything and then just figuring it out. So let's go back to your whole life. Okay. Where were you born? Born in Houston, Texas. Grew up there? No, I lived there a little bit when I was a little kid. Kind of grew up a little bit in Long Island and then went to high school, Oyster Bay. Mm -hmm. And then um, went to high school outside Boston. And what did you study in college? English literature and theater. Did you have the acting bug early on? I think so. Uh, Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I was doing little plays in my house. I was getting friends to make little movies for me once my parents got me a little video camera. All my little home movies starred my little brother, and he died in all of them. Uh, My (laughs) mom was the videographer. Wait a minute. You killed your brother off in these movies? All of them. Yeah. Wow. He died Mm. in all of them. Interesting for a shrink to take a look at that. I wonder what that means. I just just really like action movies, and so I wanted to create my own. Um, And then, you know, I I gravitated towards theater because it was just fun, and I liked the people. You know, I think when you're a young boy and you're not good at sports and you're kind of like you're either overweight or super lanky and boys are mean, like it just kind of detracted me from sports and the theater crowd was like accepting. Um, And then that's what I just kind of catered towards doing the rest of my life. Did you like straight drama or musical theater or comedy? Like what was your thing? I mean, it's when you're in school, you have to do whatever the school chooses you to do. Um, and so I would do anything. I was I was the best at comedy, though. And I didn't really realize that. I thought I wanted to be like a dramatic actor and do, you know, film later on and Broadway. And that's what I really trained for. But then the, the comedy is what I guess really took to me. And so what did you do when you graduated? You just moved to New York and said, like, I'm going to give it a shot. Yeah. Well, no. At first, because I went to Hamilton College in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. Everyone who goes there goes into banking, law, med school, something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, So I really, I didn't know what I was going to do. So I took the LSAT. I studied for it really, really hard because I thought, you know what, maybe I'll just go to law school and that's what I should do and become a lawyer. And that's what you do with your life. Um, And I totally bombed it. And I think I got into like Phoenix online law school. Mm. And I was like, you know what, I don't think I'm going to do that. Um, (laughs) And so, you know what? That's a sign. I I tried really, really hard, 
but my grandfather had died and left me like a little bit of money, Mm -hmm. um, enough to last like a year or two in New York City without having to get a job, which was nice. And I had some savings from like my my summer construction jobs, which my dad made me do uh, for eight years. And so I came to New York City and said, I'm going to give it my best and let's see if I can make this acting thing work because I didn't want to grow up and then regret that I never tried it. Right. And then- you know, I'm older and then I'm like, oh, but I never got the bug out of my system. So I tried it and did a little soap opera, uh, did As World Turns, actually won that role on an internet reality show called what? Intern on CBS.com, by the way. Stop. I swear. I think it might actually even still be there. Then I hand modeled to pay the bills. I held Let me cell- see your hands. Hold on a second. I held They're cell phones nice. for AT&T. Hold on a second. I held Nespresso capsules. You have big hands. Huge hands. Yes. Huge. Uh, that is a hand. That's a hand. That's yeah. that is a basketball playing That's hand. Awesome. A lot of people would say, "Oh, you must have played the piano," and yeah. I say, "No, I did play basketball." So when people see my hands, they say the same thing, and I say, "Yes, I did play piano." So you I have did. like piano fingers. You have very nice hands. Thanks. And they're well proportioned. Yeah, good. You know, like I have really long fingers, but that my palm is yeah. oddly small. Yeah, no. So, so I, you got it. So how much you make hand modeling? One hundred and fifty bucks an hour, dude. Yeah. Get and so out. you would do like a ten hour day, and. You know, it's that's that was the most money I'd ever seen. In that's a day. huge. Yeah, it was fifteen hundred bucks, right, in one day for holding a phone. Did you do the kind of thing that I used to do when I was a trader on Wall Street, and I would have like my first day? I'm like, oh my god, I made a thousand dollars, and then I'd say, wait, if I did this every day, yes, two hundred fifty days. I talk about a year, that all the time. Totally, it's yes. like I'm like two hundred fifty grand, awesome. You I was know? like, man, maybe I could I could hand model every day for the year, that would be insane. And then I had the same thought when I then got into real estate because uh, apparently you can't hand model every day. There's not enough work for that. Um, And I needed to pay my rent and figure out how to live and afford food in New York City. And so I became a rental agent in New York City like the other 80,000 real estate agents in this city. Okay. And my, my whole thinking was, you know what? It's the summer of 2008. My friend said, get into real estate. It's the greatest thing in the whole world. <laughs> Life you is are, amazing. You are a market timer like yes. none other. Yeah. And uh, everyone's doing it. Post ads on Craigslist. People buy apartments sight unseen. It's amazing. Uh, and I said, fine, fine, fine. I hate real estate brokers. I don't even understand what real estate is in New York City because I just wasn't focused on it right. at all. And I wasn't educated on, on it. And um, that's what I did. And I started on September 15, 2008. So how did you start your career in real estate and what is it that you really liked about it? Well, I can tell you what I really liked about it. I'd spent two years, basically, so summer of 06 to summer of 2008, just trying to act. And when you do that, you spend a significant amount of time working for nothing. You can work your ass off. You can be perfect for every role and then still not get it. Mm. I would stand in line for eight hours at Actors' Equity Auditions in Times Square, getting there at six in the morning just to try to be seen to be an understudy for some show that may never actually even happen, and then just be told, oh, they cast it already yesterday. Sorry, thanks for waiting. Mm. So it was it was a lot, a lot of work, and then you just end up spending a lot of money. You're paying rent, you're getting food, you're taking classes, you've got coaches, you're getting headshots, all this stuff. And it's just so hard to live, which is part of the part of the deal. Like no one sugarcoats it. Um, and then when I got into real estate, I, I could meet somebody and I could run around with them all day long. And it had nothing to do with my face or the color of my hair or how tall I was or if I hit my mark right. They just wanted to like the apartment or not like the apartment. It came down to the numbers. And so I had a much better chance of working for free to then get paid than I ever did as an actor. And so, whereas a lot of real estate agents who get out of the business early on have a hard time with rejection and have a hard time with working for free because there is no salary, there is no benefits. For me, I'd spent two years working for free and being told to my face, like, oh, you'd be perfect, but we don't like your face. No one has ever not taken an apartment for me because of my face. As far as you know. As far as I know. (laughs) Right. And so that was kind of liberating for me. And I've always been okay with the rejection because I was so personally rejected from all the the ups and downs of like the, you know, the acting business for two years in New York that I had built up a thick skin and like nothing. I don't take anything personally. It's so funny that you say that because I think that so many people, they'll talk about sales and they talk about the rejection of sales. Oh, I could never do sales. I could never do sales. But you had like the I mean, acting is not just you're selling yourself, but yeah. selling yourself for a particular part and yeah. working really hard and that you have to deal with that rejection that you could just be like, OK, next. Yeah. And so tell me about the first time you made a real estate sale. 
Oh man, the first time I made a sale took me a long time. Uh, I would say my first sale was a referral from a rental deal that I did in Long Island City. Um, Because when I first started, the whole job, really, there's no boss. Like, there's no mentor in real estate. Now I tell people not to do it the way I did, which is just sit at a computer, post ads on Craigslist, and Godspeed. (laughs) Right? That's that's really – and then it's like, how do you meet people? I don't know. How do you get leads? I don't know. Like, go to Starbucks. See if you can find people. Right. If there's a pregnant lady, see if she needs more space like that literally was that was that was the direction that was given to me as a 24 year old Mm. real estate agent coming into the great mentorship. Yeah. So I had to figure out everything on my own, um, which I wouldn't recommend to anybody. Uh, I would suggest getting on a team and learning from somebody. Right. Especially for the first three years. But, you know, so I did a lot of rentals in Koreatown, which is where I lived, mm-hmm. uh, and Long Island City, which is where it was just easier to get people to do things than it was in Manhattan or Brooklyn. Um, and so that first deal was $399,000 at 3 Hanover Square, apartment 10M. And I had to paint it, and I had to do all the open houses by myself, and it was just, it was dirty, and it was messy, but we eventually sold it to a single girl whose dad was helping her with the purchase. And I think she had just graduated and was working around the corner. Uh, I think we did the deal for like three seventy nine. When you sold that, you obviously you get a boost of confidence. Um, are you did you stay with the same real estate agency? Yeah, I've the been whole with time? the same company since I started. You want to plug them? I, I can. I mean, I say uh, the company is called Nest Seekers. When mm-hmm. I started, I think there were three people. Now there's like 800. Get out. Yeah. Are you an owner of it? No. Damn it. But I lead the largest team in the city by far out of mm. all real estate companies. Um, and so, but it's, you know, a lot of people bounce around from company to company to company, which I understand if there's better deals, better splits. But I've always felt it was better to just make the grass greener on the lawn you're already at. Like that, that, that costs a lot less than the reciprocal damage that you'll have going from company to company to company to company. And there's always something weird I find by like people who can't last at one company. And then I'm like, well, are you greedy because you went somewhere else? Or maybe you're a problem child. Like when you look at sports, athletes who are on 10 teams for their career, it's like there's something going on there. You sort of like are building your career at the depths of the real estate cratering in New York. Yeah. So besides Craigslist, once you start to get a few sales under your belt, what do you discover about the sales process that you're like, wait, I'm good at this. What is it that you're good at? I think at the beginning, you know, I was very disciplined. And I looked at a lot of the other real estate agents who would come into the office at 10 before an appointment, print something out, go on an appointment. They either get a deal done or they don't. They complain about it later. They ran around like their head was cut off like a chicken. And every year was the same as the year before. And it was just this up and down roller coaster of sales, which is what it's like for most people. And I said to myself, you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm incredibly organized. I'm in, I'm very disciplined. It's the way that I was raised. Um, and I'm going to treat this job as if I were an investment banker. you know. And so I'm going to wake up at a certain time and go to bed at a certain time. And I'm going to schedule myself all day long, even if I don't have clients. Because if I take care of the work, the work will take care of me. I feel like people in in real estate where you can have a big payday, they, they really focus on one property. Yeah. And you say that is not the best idea, that you really need to have more than one ball in the air. So yeah. can you talk a little bit about how you filled your pipeline and how you manage that? You know, a little, it's a little secret here. With the book, um, when I first wrote the proposal, the title uh, was Balls Up. And that's how I sold it. And then the publisher came back to me and was like, mm. Listen, we love it, but we should talk about your title. Really? <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, I was, I was fine with it. But it's, listen, my, my kind of sales game theory, if you will, is that there's this mentality that you need to be hyper-focused on deal by deal by deal. But that gives me somewhat of a heart attack because not every deal goes through. And then if that's what you do, your deal volume will be low and you need to focus on as many deals as possible, which is really hard to do. And that's what I talk about a lot in the book is trying to figure out how to control that chaos. And you do that with structured discipline. Like it's not it's not hard. You just have to know what to do, when to do. And then you have to be accountable to yourself and set expectations. And then when balls fall, which they will always fall, you have to do what's best for the group. Right. Which is also then best for the individual. And that's how I lead my team. I think that's very smart. And it's something that's lost in the sales process. And part of the the discipline around that and filling that pipeline 
it's yes, you get new people in. Yes, you're working at a number of things, but you actually have specific actions that you talk about, which I have dog-eared this, by the way, because I'm an old salesperson. Love it. And I loved the idea of the three Fs. Yeah. By the book, but I want to tell you about the three Fs. Talk about the follow-up. Yeah. I, my publisher was like, you sure you want to write a whole chapter on follow-up? I was like, <laughs> yes. I was like, yes, yes. It will be interesting because the story, the deals that I've done and the stories that I can tell just because of follow-up and like that deal that took me five years and all of that will be interesting and, and um, I proved them wrong. So uh, follow-up is uh, the key to my whole life and I break it down into three forms and they call them the three Fs and it's follow-up, follow-through, follow-back. And for people who are visual, I try to explain it as like a game of golf, right? Follow up is the first smack of the ball. You cannot get the ball in the hole unless you hit the damn ball, right? Follow through is making sure that you have follow through with your swing so the ball goes where you want it to go, right? And then follow back is going and finding the ball, checking on it, making sure it's good, and then you hit it back again. And eventually you'll get it in the hole. And then if you do a good job, maybe you get to play the next hole, the next hole, the next hole. Um, So follow up is... You know, you can never wait for someone to talk to you, like in sales or whatever your job is. It's not the other person's job to have interest in your life and in what you do. It is your job and your job alone to get them interested. And that's what that initial follow up is. So I will follow up with everyone until the day that they die or the day that I die. Um, And it's not harassing. It's not annoying. You're following up with value. You're letting them know about new options, new incentives. You're checking in. You're following up and wishing them happy holidays, right? You're wishing them happy birthday. You're wishing their dog happy birthday. Little things because you have to build a personal relationship with people. And I think that what it does also is it makes you stand out in a business where there's not a huge amount of professionalism and that follow through. And I remember feeling when I bought my first house, like, God damn it. Like, I'm, why am I calling you? Like, Always. I'm, right? And makes you feel insane a little yeah, bit, drives right? You crazy. Technology has gone such a long way. I mean, you don't have to follow up just by email or just by phone. I follow up with people through Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, text message, WhatsApp, Snapchat. Everybody is on every platform now. LinkedIn is huge for a lot of people who work in financial service firms where they can't use social media during the day. Um, They find different ways and creative ways to follow up with people just because it's like it blows my mind that people don't do it because I always I view every relationship like my marriage. You know, where tell us about your marriage, right? My marriage is great. All right, good. It's great. Um, but I like if you're getting someone to sell with you or buy with you, like you are creating a bond there. Right? You don't have to sleep next to that person, but you're creating a bond where they're putting trust in you versus anyone else in the world at that moment. And this is a huge transaction. Yeah. Let's be honest. Even from, if it's a small transaction. But, it, but for most people, real estate, that transaction, oh, it's, it's like sure. a, represents a massive part sure. of your life, right? Yes. Yeah. And if I don't talk to them for a week or two weeks, they're going to feel that I'm ignoring them. This is Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. We'll get back to our interview with Ryan Serhant in just a minute. But it's interesting how he talks so much about process, about sticking to a process to help you, to help one, sell more professionally and earn more and become basically a sales machine. What he's doing in the real estate business is not unlike what our sponsor Betterment has done in the investing business. Betterment is an online financial advisor for people who refuse to settle for average. Betterment uses cutting-edge technology to build personalized portfolios and help you make more from your investments. Then they guide you along the way. They've got advice to help you make smart financial decisions, all of this for one low, transparent fee. Whether you're planning for retirement or planning for college, whatever goal you have in mind, Betterment is going to help you reach those goals. Don't settle for average investing. Demand better. All investing involves risk. That said, Better Off listeners can get up to one year managed free by visiting Betterment.com slash Better Off. That's Betterment.com slash Better Off. And now back to our interview with sales machine, Ryan Serhant. It's interesting because in in sales, sometimes a really wonderful salesperson is a crapo manager. Mm -hmm. So how do you divide your time between you yourself selling because you love to sell and managing the team? Um, I manage more than I sell now. 
but I manage with that sales hat on, so to speak. You know, I'm not managing people's emotions or their feelings. I'm not managing their time. Like they're grown ups, they should be able to do that on their own. But I'm giving them management tips and tools, and we're trying to figure out together how they can be better salespeople and how we can sell our product better together. Um, so it's, you know, I like to mix it a lot. This, this, that same question kind of goes hand in hand when people ask me how I have a life work balance if I work all the time. But I just, I don't think about it that way. I don't think about it as A and B. Otherwise, I think I would go insane, mm. right? I, there has to be synergy to everything. So you're always selling and always managing. You're always working and always like living and talking to your wife by text message, sending photos like all day long. So you're always touching your client, touching your partner, touching your family, everything. And technology has just made it that much easier. Like shame on you if you can't say hi to people every day. What do you think are the three biggest mistakes that buyers make in real estate? Uh, biggest mistake is they don't buy real estate. <laughs> I think. Um, Although I love renting sometimes. I think renting can really work for a lot of people. And, sure. they, and certainly like, especially in a place like New York where there's inventory. Yes. And if you want maybe portability of your life and your job. And, yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's get so, to. Well, the caveat to my answer there, part one, is not buying. That's That's the biggest mistake buyers make. That's not the biggest mistake that people who want to live in a city make, right? Renting might be the best for you. A lot of times renting would be cheaper than buying and you should save your money. If you don't have enough money for a down payment, if you don't have enough money to save, if you're going to be nervous, like then don't do it. Right. You don't have to. The American dream isn't owning a home anymore. The American dream is being happy, is being happy and being free. But if you're actually going to buy, the biggest mistake you can make is just not doing it. And I see that time and time again where people, they're on the fence, they jump off. They're on the fence, they jump off. They're nervous, nervous, nervous. 9.9 .9 times out of 10, they always end up spending more money on a place that they like less than the one they should have bought in the first place because they overthink and that analysis paralysis kicks in. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, what's another mistake a buyer makes? Uh, another mistake a buyer makes is that they f either forget or just don't think about how the home is only one part of the transaction. You don't just live in the home, you live in the neighborhood. You live on the block, right? Have you seen what the trash route is with the garbage trucks? Have you seen where the bus stop is? Have you seen where all the kids go every day? Have you really kind of taken a look at like what that neighborhood is, you know, detailed? And not just saying, okay, well, I want to be in Soho. All right, great. Well, Soho, every block is different. Literally every intersection of Soho is different than the one before it, and it makes a big difference in where you live because mm -hmm. traffic is different in different locations. Stores have different lines, everything. Some streets are quieter. Some streets are busier. Same thing in you know in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So um, you have to really pay attention to the neighborhood, almost more so than the home. And I think the third mistake that people make is they put too much emphasis on the way the home feels today. Like they make too much emphasis. They walk into a home and they say, oh, you know, this isn't for me because I don't like the color of the kitchen. Or they're like, well, I, but yeah, but the rooms are too small. That neighborhood is so important and the bones are so important. Everything else can always be value add. You can always change things. You can always update later on. Like little things like that. You can't change where the house is. I mean, I guess you can pick up a house and move it. For the most part, you're not going to do that. Right. So you can't change where it is. Um, and you just want to get the best deal you possibly can. Oh, I like those three tips. So what about for sellers? I mean, the biggest mistake is pricing too high. Yeah. And the and what I mean by that is, uh, one, if sure, pricing too high for the market. But it's also pricing too high because you think the asking price actually means something. There's a big difference now compared to the way real estate used to be sold. I think it used to be, and this is before my time, you put an ad in the paper, right? The brokers would have it in their MLS or in their office, and you'd price maybe with a little negotiating room or at what it was worth because that's how people had to search for property. Now, everyone buys and searches for property on their phone or on a computer, but most people are mobile these days, and there's price categories. So if your home is worth $500,000, let's say, you know, and you price it at five fifty. dollars that is now a buyer, okay? That's in a category where the buyer is forced, forced with no choice to look up to $600,000 hmm. and go to a shoe store with a budget of 50 bucks, right? If on that shelf you are forced to look up to $100, all of a sudden your $50 shoes look kind of terrible. Yeah. And that $90 pair of shoes seems expensive, but man, is it nice and it's right there. And you might not buy it because it's expensive, but you're going to buy the one that's 75 bucks because what's another $25 to get a nice pair of shoes? Mm. 
Same thing happens in real estate, right? So you price that thing at four ninety nine, which to a lot of sellers they won't do because they're like, well, that's that's way too cheap. No, it's too cheap. I can't, I can't. The listing price is everything, and they shoot themselves in the foot, right? You price to bid. You do not price to sell. I had a neighbor who. Um, is lamenting because I can't believe my house isn't selling. What do you think the problem is? I said, well, if it's not selling, you know what the problem is. Always. Listen, I, there's the three P's. Um, another sidetrack to your main question here, but you have price, presentation, um, and patience. So price always comes first. Right? It's oftentimes always price. But maybe the price is right, but the presentation of your home is just terrible. Like, do you really like the color red? Do you have red walls and brown couches? Do your kids make a mess everywhere? That first impression of that home is really, really important. So maybe the price is right, but the presentation of your home is just gross. Like, clean it up. Mm -hmm. Paint white. Put some nice, cheap art in around. Like, let someone walk in and see it as a blank canvas for themselves to live there, not walk through your home, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And then patience, listen... There's a lot of markets out there um, that are not just New York City where sometimes it just takes time right. to find that right person. Okay. So pricing incorrectly. Pricing incorrectly. Two. Two. I mean, the biggest, the second biggest mistake people make is not getting their home ready to actually go to market. So staging it? Staging. Is... Yeah, staging presentation. Yeah. Kind of what I just said. Okay. Right. It's staging. It's the presentation. It's making it look like a first date. Right. Because that, that first 30 days on the market you're getting a lot of first dates. You want to look your best. Yeah, of course. You want to look your best. Put your best foot forward. You know, and a lot of sellers say, well, our location's great. I put all these renovations in. It's fine. Put it on the market. You know, I'm not going to do this because I don't want to spend the $10,000 to clean it up. And then six months later, they sell for $300,000 less than they wanted to in the beginning because they were penny wise and pound foolish. What's the third mistake a seller makes? The third mistake a seller makes is trying to do it on their own. I know it's so hard. That whole, you know, fizzbo. Pennywise, pound foolish. You Just, try to save the commission, and you you end up paying for it anyway. Uh, how'd you get into TV? Now coming full circle, I got out of TV. They yeah. got out of TV. Got into real real estate. estate. Rocked and rolled into real estate. Then what happened? Um, then there was a casting call in the real estate trades in the city, um, casting for the greatest brokers in the history of New York City to do a spinoff show of a show called Million Dollar Listing that aired on Bravo in Los Angeles. And they were going to do the New York version. And I went to an open casting call with 3,000 agents. Stop. Nine months later, they cast four of us. And they said, all right, we're going to shoot the first season of the show with four of you. One of you is not going to make the final cut. Bring us the best properties, the best buyers, and let's make the best TV. And one of us got cut. But not you. Not me. Because I was stressed out the whole time. I was like, <laughs> I don't want to be cut. I can't be fired off another. Like, I imagine being a, like a, a, a new real estate agent. Like, I can't be fired off a real estate reality TV show. My career will be over. The same way I thought about intern on CBS.com. It's like, I have to win this thing. I want to be an actor. I can't be fired off a, an actor reality show. It'll ruin my career. So being on the show, did it propel you to a whole different universe professionally? <laughs> no. Um, it's what it did was it made opening the door a little bit easier, but it's New York. Like at the beginning, no one cared. It was a, it was a reality TV show on Bravo. People knew Bravo for housewives and they did not take it seriously, but it helped me open the door and I, and I used it right for, for the few of us that have been on the show for a while now, like you, you take what you have and you just milk it. And you use it. So it brings great exposure. It's great exposure for properties. It's it's advertising that I could never, ever, ever afford. And it airs to 25 million people around the world. And we've been doing it for seven years now. But I still had to close. I still had to then convince people that I was a real broker and not just on TV and dancing around. Um, so it was a it was a pedestal, but it didn't help me. It didn't give me business. I had to go get it all by myself. What's going on in New York City real estate as we speak? Oh, man. Um, New York City real estate has a problem. The easiest way to say it is that there's an inventory problem, but that's okay because that'll change. Inventory comes and goes. It ebbs and flows. What's great about New York City is that the demand never changes. Like since 2002, the same amount of homes sell in New York every year, plus or minus like 5%. That's crazy to me. The booms, the bus, everything between 11 and 12,000 homes in New York sell every year, no matter what. Right now, we're in this weird limbo phase where 10 years has gone by, right? 
Everyone thinks that cycles happen in 10-year cycles. Nothing's happened yet. Stock market feels too high. There's a lot of weird things happening in the news and politically and geopolitically. So people are just nervous. And around the water cooler, everyone's saying we're in the bottom of the ninth. And it starts with bankers. And they shouldn't do that because it creates a crisis of confidence amongst consumers. And that's what we have at the moment. Mm. And when that'll break, I don't know. I mean, it is a heavy buyer's market now in New York City, more than I've ever seen in my short 10-year career. I mean, the deals you can get now are nuts. Um, and hopefully it will get better, but I just don't know. Right now, what is your favorite undiscovered neighborhood in New York that you think there's great value? Like, people are listening to this. Maybe people have just got, like, they're young, they're working in the city, and you're like, Brooklyn's dead. Don't do Brooklyn. <laughs> Whatever you're going to say. I don't know what you're going to say, but what's the, what's Honestly, the, what's the hidden gem? <clears throat> I'm still surprised that the Hudson Square area of Manhattan, which some people call North Tribeca on the other side of Canal, some people call it West Soho, some people call it Noka for north of Canal, um, has not exploded more so. It is a few block walk into Tribeca, into Soho, and into the West Village. It's this tiny little square. Um, it's called Hudson Square, which is just, it, it won't stick for that long because it doesn't really make sense. It might be because there's not enough retail and grocery and all that, and the buildings are too like big and it's manufacturing. But like that area is prime Manhattan where the deals are still like great. You know, you go one block south and you're paying $1,000 a foot more. You go two blocks to the east, you're paying 600 a foot more. You go into the West Village, forget about it. And that's a five minute walk. Um, so that's an area that I think is still relatively undiscovered by people who want, you know, good deals, but want to live in prime Manhattan. Okay. Well, give me two more. Bushwick in Brooklyn and, and Harlem. You know, we have a big project coming up, um, in Harlem, a big rental project. That's going to be very, very, very cool. And every time I go up there, I'm like, why don't, why don't more people not live up here? It's not, it's not far. It's literally right here. It's easier to get to everywhere than it is if you're in Brooklyn. Um, and I think it's, I don't know, I think it's its slowly coming around. It just takes a lot of time because there's a lot of Harlem. Like there's a little bit of Hudson Square. There's a little bit of Bushwick. There's a lot of Harlem. It's There's a lot up there. All right. When we started the program, I said, what was your best financial or career decision? Yeah. We're going to finish off with your worst. What was your worst career or financial decision? Oh, man. I I spent a lot of money on stupid advertising <laughs> that you would think that as a relatively young person surrounded by young people, why I would spend so much money on on advertising that I just knew would get me nowhere, but I felt like I needed to do it. Even though I know the advertising world has changed and PR is so much more valuable, I, I, I regret it every day. <laughs> All right. Well, that's not such a terrible regret. But it's, but it's cash, right? I mean, yeah. it's, cash flow will kill you. I'm very, very careful with money otherwise, and I hate spending money because I distinctly remember having no money in the summer of 2008 and sitting on the subway after getting my debit card declined and feeling awful, and I run from that moment every day for the rest of my life. And I, so I get nervous a lot about spending too much because what if the real estate market tanks? Then do I have to go back to hand modeling? Like, what am I going to do? Your hands still look good. Sell Thanks. It Like Sir Hunt is the book. Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much to Ryan Sirhant. It was so much fun to meet him. And really, he's a he's a great talker and fun to chat about the real estate market. Don't forget, we drop new episodes of Better Off every Tuesday and Thursday. If you'd like to get on the air with us, just shoot us an email. Ask Jill at betteroffpodcast.com. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Talercio is our executive producer. We are distributed by Cadence 13 and we're sponsored by Betterman. See you next week. 